Let's get started, everyone. Are we officially out of donuts? Do we have any more donuts left, or are we out? Are we out of donuts? We have five donuts left. So five donuts left. All right. Okay, let's get started here today. Uh, a couple announcements here to pass on to you here. Uh, just a brief mention, the bulletin said uh, the announcement sheets of Women's Bible Study on Tuesday and Wednesday. Uh, just a brief correction, that was a carryover from last week. Uh, Women's Bible Study was last Wednesday because I had a funeral on Tuesday I had to attend to. So this week, Women's Bible Study will be back on Tuesday, so make sure there's no, no confusion on that. So men's Bible study is 645, women's Bible study is at 1030 on Tuesday. So keep note of that. Also, uh, I was asked to mention, <clears throat> we have this women's retreat coming up that is actually being hosted by the Botno Church, and it's called the Turtle Mountain Women's Retreat. It's going to be at the camp uh, September 29th, if I'm not mistaken, to October 1st, a three-day conference. And uh, so Reverend Bill uh, Swirla from Southern California is coming to speak. Um, I... I, I, I don't know Bill like very, very close, but I do know of him, and I've had conversations online and so forth. Very good theologian, uh, long-standing pastor in the LCMS. He's actually retired right now, but he's going to be speaking at the conference. Uh, gals, it's worth your time uh, to, to go up and engage uh, with, with the content of what Bill will be presenting. So keep that in mind. If you have more questions on it, um, I know there's several in the church that are already registered to go. Um, I know Betty is registered, but she had some sheets for registration, but she's out. They're all back here. So if you want to register, talk to the church office. We'll get some uh, registration sheets printed out. It looks like they're all gone here at this point, which is a good thing. Okay? All right. Um, other thing I was supposed to mention to you, I'm not sure if there's any sheets over there. We had some sheets on the back table with respect to the upcoming voters meeting. The uh, council is going to do its best here on next Sunday uh, to get... Uh, the packets out to you ahead of time to read over. And then there's also an appraisal that was done that uh, want, they want released to you. So I was asked to mention that. I think it'll be on the back table. If not, we'll get it by next Sunday on that table for you as well. It should also be online on the Facebook page too, so keep that in mind. Okay, any other, uh, anything, anything else I'm supposed to mention here or pass along to you? <clears throat> yes. Uh, there's extra zucchini by the door. <laughs> extra zucchini bread. Zucchini. Zucchini, zucchini not zucchini bread. You're not going to bake it. Oh, come on. I thought you were going to bake it for us. No, extra zucchini. Extra. Uh, so zucchinis are by the front door? By the door right there. By the door right there. Okay. Awesome. That's from you guys? All right. So help yourself. Okay. Anything else for announcements? Okay, let's pray, and uh, we'll jump into the uh, topic for today, okay? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the gift of truth for our ears to hear. May we always be captive to your eternal truth uh, today and forevermore. In Jesus' name, who is our truth and life. Amen. Okay, so if you have your sheet... Okay, if you have your sheet, um, <clears throat> this is called The Fight for Truth. Our topic for the month of July was on the topic of truth itself. Next month, we're going to have uh, what's titled The Case for Creeds. And so we'll get into that next month. If, you're not, if you have not heard, uh, there was a uh, Sparkle Creed that was confessed here a while back during the month of June in a, uh, uh, another Lutheran denominational church. And so we're talking about the importance of creeds. What are they? Why do we say them? History of creeds. And then we'll talk a little bit about the social context, about how this uh, creed was confessed in Minnesota at a church called the Sparkle Creed. And we'll actually watch that. And, um, you know, we'll, 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 we'll smile, but we should also cry as well as we look at that. But then we'll talk about, again, like the uh, basis of the creeds, okay? All right. But for this month, we're looking at the fight for truth. Let's look at the introduction, and I'll explain to you briefly what we're going to be covering the introduction says on the top left, it says on your sheet, Well, the LCMS experienced the battle for the Bible back in the 1970s. Today's battle is for truth. Let's pause. <clears throat> it seems to me, as I look at church history, it seems to me that every generation typically has a big fight uh, in the church. 
um, every generation has a big fight that will mark that generation, the fight that they have to accomplish and, and, and prevail against. The fight of the previous generation uh, was the fight during Seminex, uh, Seminex, which was the fight over the battle for the Bible. Now, if you, without going into a ton of detail, what happened is in the 1970s, there were professors that were teaching uh, contrary to uh, the Holy Scriptures, and uh, they were called out. And they were basically given an ultimatum. And um, as a result of the ultimatum, uh, they, in protest, they, they packed up their bags, basically, and they, <clears throat> they uh, left the uh, uh, seminary and they walked out in exile. And so they call it seminary in exile, seminex. And so you had a bunch of staff and students that left. And it was a, ensued a very, very big battle in the Missouri Senate over the battle for the Bible. As a result of it, if I'm not mistaken, about 300,000 people left the Missouri Senate over this battle. Uh, numerous professors left and so forth, and it was uh, a very, very big battle. As a result of the battle, though, the Missouri Senate became more conservative or less? More conservative because the conservative side stuck to their guns. And so for that generation in the 1970s, we are going to be eternally grateful for the fight that our forefathers and those who came before us, how they fought for the integrity of the scriptures. And so uh, for me, coming in from the outside of the Missouri Senate, into the Missouri Senate, I look at that and I'm like, that was very, very comforting and very encouraging to see. And so we can say that God be praised for the 1970s, those who stood and fought for what is true and what is right. And so we say, God be praised for that. Now, Yesterday's battles are not always tomorrow's battles. We have a different battle right before us that I would say is of the same importance of the Seminex battle. Um, it's just as heavy, um, maybe if not more, but we'll cover it here today a little bit. Okay. So in other words, today's battle is not over what is truth, but rather it is a fight for truth. Okay. More specifically, uh, the battle is over what we call a logocentric worldview. Yes, Bob. Yeah, so it was predominantly in the St. Thank you for asking that. It was predominantly in the St. Louis Seminary uh, where it happened. Um, obviously, it wasn't restricted only to that seminary, but it, that's where the battle uh, where it kind of sparked. Um, so I've heard I've heard arguments for and against two different seminaries. I've heard arguments saying that it's good to have one seminary so that you can what keep a close look on it. Or other arguments that saying it's good to have two seminaries so they hold each other each other in tension. Um, there's a lot of different arguments on that. I don't. I guess what do they say? Um, I, I I graduated. I did my doctoral studies in St. Louis. Now, keep in mind the St. Louis Seminary right now is not the same seminary in the 1970s, obviously. Uh, so seminaries with the change of professors and the change of that, things change. Um, so one thing worth mentioning, it is pretty remarkable to think that our St. Louis Seminary at that time, the 1970s, uh, basically uh, the majority of the, the faculty and staff uh, left and they formed their own seminary in St. Louis and then what do we do as as a St. Louis or as Missouri Senate? We called up a bunch of pastors and we just popped them in there. We have very very, and I'm not saying this to pat myself on the back, but objectively, we have very very highly trained pastors in the Lutheran Church Missouri Senate, and that's something that we can be very very happy about. We have very very highly trained uh, uh, pastors that many who could easily make the jump to what be a professor in the seminary. Um, so yeah, so it's predominantly St. Louis. Now, that St. Louis Seminary right now is a whole lot different than that time. But always we need reform. There's always needing to be reform. There are things in the St. Louis Seminary that need reformation and correction. There's same things in Fort Wayne that need to be gently corrected. And so seminaries are always needing to be reformed, always needing, needing to keep an eye on them because it's easy to what? Easy to always drift just a little bit. The same with the church. We always need to reform the church, always keeping a close eye on our doctrine and what we teach and what we believe. That makes sense? Okay? So, <clears throat> the battle today is over what we call a logocentric worldview. Now, you're going to say, oh my goodness, what is that? I'm going to explain that to you, okay? The neat thing with using complicated words is once you learn them, you can impress your friends and confound your enemies. Okay? So, I'm going to teach you what these words mean. 
and will understand it. It's very, very, uh, it's very complex, but yet simple. So at the end of this time, you guys will understand it. I promise you that. Okay, so what does it mean to be logocentric? Okay, logocentric, I haven't heard of that. Okay, let's back up here. In approximately 500 BC, so we're talking 500 years, approximately 500 years before the birth of Christ, we're talking 2,500 years ago from right now, approximately, a philosopher named Heraclitus said, do not listen to me, but listen to the Logos. Logos or Logos. Okay, I tend to pronounce it Logos. All things come into being accordance, in accordance with the Logos. According to Heraclitus, everything was changing from day to day and from moment to moment. His famous illustration was that it was impossible to step twice into the same river. But if that be so, why was life not complete chaos if it was always changing? For Heraclitus, the Logos was the real feature of the cosmos that stayed the same. According to Heraclitus, the world is full of change, but it is not in chaos, but is structured by a world order that is divine in nature. Okay, now, he was not a Christian, okay, Heraclitus. He was a pagan philosopher. However, <clears throat> at the same time, he understood that there was something out there, and he said it was divine in nature, it was godish, and that godlike thing, which he called the Logos, was the thing that held everything in existence, held things together. Although many, many, many may derive from the Logos, it is there and available to all. The wise, he went on to say, are those who listen to the Logos and honor the Logos. The fools are those who disregard the Logos and deviate from it. So think of it this way, and uh, maybe repeating myself on this, I've, I've taught this before several times in different Bible studies, but it's good for us to cement it again. Imagine coming... For the first time, imagine coming down to Minot State, and let's just say you're going to go listen to an orchestra play. And you walk in, okay? And what happens typically kind of before the orchestra starts, starts playing? They're all kind of, what, warming up. So you have the violins kind of making their noise. You have the cellos making their noise. Maybe you have some trumpets or like playing the scale, <clears throat> scale going all the way up A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and then all the way back down. You have the tubas playing and the trumpets and then the, get this, the people on the, on the snare kind of making. And what happens? You have a, uh, uh, just a, a cluster of information, right, I mean, uh, of sounds, right? You have... You have flutes, you have violins, and nothing sounds orderly, right? Mm -hmm. And if you were to walk in <clears throat> and sit down and say, what did I miss? And somebody says to you, well, here it is. You'd be like, listen, you'd be like, it's just chaos all over the place. And then let's just say, let's just say, for whatever reason, let's just say your, your head is down and you're looking through this bulletin maybe they have or tying your shoe, whatever. And then all of a sudden, uh, you're not looking up, and all of a sudden, boom, you hear noise and the flutes come in, and the violin comes to accompany, and the trumpets play, and it's all working together. You put but your head up and say, what? What happened? How on earth could all of those varying instruments be pulled together in one unit and work together as one orchestra? And you look, and you see what? A conductor, a guy with, uh, you know, Guy with, you know, like the, they always have those long tails, right? And the, you know, the, 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 the magic wand, right? Sorry for the music instructors. <laughs> and, and, and what? He's making the, the motion, right? For the beats. Maybe 4-4 four, four time or 6-8 time, right? Making the sign of the beats and everybody's following him and he's what? Orchestrating. So you say, aha, it makes sense. There's what? Something at the center that's conducting all things, holding it together. There is a conductor or there is a logos, right? There's some order. That's what Heraclitus was saying. He looked at the life and he said there has to be something at the very center that's orchestrating all this. And that thing he called the logos. And then he also said that logos is not of human origin. It's what? Divine. Now, he was not saying necessarily a, a, a you know, Judeo-Christian God, per se, was just a divineness to this Logos. Okay? That makes sense? Okay? So, there was a challenge, though. Approximately 450 B.C., a philosopher named Protagoras. Now, don't name your children Protagoras. Okay? Or, you know, don't encourage your, you know, your grandchildren would be named Protagoras. Not a good name. <clears throat> Protagoras said this. 
Of all things, the measure is man. Of existing things that they exist, of non-existing things that they do not exist. So for Protagoras, the individual being, rather than the logos, was the ultimate source of value. Personal experience, judgment, and interpretation rule. How is one to discern the truth from mere opinion? The Protagoras and his fellow sophists, these are the group of people that believe this, their answer was that they cannot. All that we have and all that we will ever have are opinions. For human beings, things are as they seem to be. No more can be said. What happened to Protagoras and the sophists, though? Well, later on, these guys, you've heard of them before, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, they pushed back, and they were able to uphold a logocentric culture, which we know as Western civilization. So I'm covering several hundred years, okay? So you have, you have um, Protagoras right here, and then you have Heraclitus here. Heraclitus says that we don't, what, look to the individual. Heraclitus says, no, no, no. We can't look to the individual, all the individual parts, okay? We have to look, we have to look to what? The logos, okay? Have to look to the logos as the source, right? And the logos is what then what? Is an objective source that speaks into the varying things of life, the differing opinions of people and things. The logos is the thing that's at the center. <laughs> Protagoras, though, he comes along and he says what? Look at the quote there. It's a real famous quote. Of all things, the measure is what? Man. So Protagoras said, nah, -uh. the measure of man is not what? He would say it's not the logos. Okay? It's the measure of all things is what? What man believes. And you've heard Protagoras. You've heard it. And you've, this is where you actually hear the spirit of Protagoras right now in 2023. Well, it may be true for you, but it's not true for me. My truth is my truth. Your truth is your truth. That's straight out of the playbook of who? Protagoras from 2,500 years ago. That makes sense? There's nothing new under the sun. There's nothing new under the sun. Long story short, Protagoras and his buddies, the Sophists, okay, they're not soap. I was saying it's the Sophists, I think soap, I don't know why, but the Sophists, they all said that the measure of man, <clears throat> the measure of all things is mankind, back to the individual, okay? So as a result, <clears throat> Aristotle, Plato, and Socrates, right? Aristotle, uh, Plato, and Socrates, they saw this mindset of of uh, Protagoras, and they believe that if every single person did what was right in their own eyes, what would happen? Now, let, let's just say in this room, we have about 75, 80 people in here. Let's just say we all went to the church service, and we all did church the way that we wanted. What I individually, so what, what I want and what you want, what, and we all, and we just went in there, what would happen? It would be It'd be kind of fun to see. <laughs> I would probably just give up. I'd probably just walk up front and everybody's, maybe, you know, maybe uh, Betty's like, you know, I want to sing this hymn. And Barb's, no, I want to sing this hymn. And then and then Jason says, I want divine service setting, what, you know, three. And then, you know, Anya says, no, I want setting one. And then everybody's just going. It's just chaos. I would probably walk up and I'd just take my all off and throw it on the ground and go in the sacristy or go home. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Because you would have absolute what? Chaos. So the point is, Aristotle, Plato, and Socrates, they saw that a society that is governed where everyone is a truth unto themselves would result in complete and total chaos, a breakdown of society. Okay? So they fought back, and they actually won. Okay? And as a result, you had a logocentric uh, culture, which is what we know as Western civilization. Make sense? Okay, so why does this matter? Okay, there's a guy named Jacques Derrida, okay, Jacques Derrida, and he was 1930 to 2004. He is most noted for his work in the field of what is called deconstructionism, okay? Deconstructionism, what does that sound like? Unbuilding. Yeah, unbuilding, you take things. So <clears throat> we've been watching... Uh, uh, what is the, 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 the Gaines, right? Uh, Jim, Chip and Joanna Gaines. We've, 
the fixer upper, we've been watching that a lot at our house. We have a lot of fun. And what I what we always appreciate about Chip, if you guys this is a husband wife, they they yeah. buy old houses and they yeah. fix them up and they sell them and it's just it's really fun to watch. We watch it with the kids. And but Chip, he always loves demolition day. Mm. He just loves demolition day. And he gets so excited because he comes in and he gets to what? Tear, Tear things out. Now what's interesting, demolition day, when they do demolition day, it's only what? Typically it's only what? One or two days. Mm-hmm. And he's he's running into walls. He has a jack jackhammer and a big sledgehammer. He's knocking down things. Just He guts it out, and that usually happens one or two days. And then to fix and build it takes what? Weeks, weeks upon weeks. And so I want to add, before we even get into this, to deconstruct, is it easier to deconstruct or construct? Easy. It's easier, yeah. yeah. Anybody can come and tear something down. Yeah. Uh, anybody can tear something down, but then to build something... It's usually two to three times harder to build something up, okay? So the deconstructionists are most noted uh, by this guy named Jacques Derrida. And so deconstructionism is a field of study that questions traditional assumptions about certainty, identity, and truth. Note this. This is from actually a philosophy book. The aim of the deconstructionists is to dislodge Western civilization from its logocentric presumptions. What does it sound like? The deconstructionists are attacking what? They're trying to what? Get rid of the logocentric worldview. And what are they actually proponents of? They're proponents of Protagoras. Okay, that man is the major of all things. It is important to remember that the modern day deconstructionists are not new. They're merely repeating the same ideology of Protagoras and the Sophists. Again, there's nothing new under the sun. And so currently, Western civilization is in a battle not with Protagoras, Protagoras or ancient Sophists, but with the neo sophists Neo, no, the word neo, I don't know why they just put the word neo sophists it means, neo means new. It just sounds cooler, right? So the new Sophists, the deconstructionists. The ideology of Protagoras is alive and well in America. The only question is whether the deconstructionists will prevail or not. We pause there. Are you seeing this happening in our culture? Yes, Wally. Yep, you see it in all aspects. Yep, it is happening in all aspects. It's happening where we're deconstructing uh, our idea of gender, right? Uh, it's happening how we deconstruct uh, the Christian faith, uh, how we deconstruct uh, this idea of, of um, right and wrong, um, of a greater good. Anything that has a logocentric point of view of something objective and outside is being deconstructed and pulled down. Even our English language. It, it, absolutely, 100%. I, I, I almost yelled out, Amen. The language itself is being deconstructed, okay? Words are being dislodged from reality, okay? So the deconstructionists, I cannot emphasize this enough, the deconstructionists are the greatest threat, and they're not some sort of boogeyman. It's a reality. They're the biggest threat on the church right now and our civilization, okay? So the Battle of Seminex back in the 1970s the intensity of that battle is the same battle that we have right now, right here, against deconstructionists. And the interesting thing is, there are deconstructionists everywhere. They're even here in Minot, mm-hmm. and they don't often even know that they are. Okay? Uh, they often don't know they even are. Yes? And at least in the Seminex, the battle was localized. Mm-hmm. Now it's nationwide. Yep. So yep. Bigger. Yep. Yep. Okay. Any other thoughts? We're going to. Now, here's. What does this matter to Christianity? I want you to turn, if you have your Bibles, or turn on your cell phones to John 1 1. Okay? And John 1 14. Okay? Now, I'm going to read this in the original language, not to impress you, but I want you to listen. And to see what you hear. Okay? So John 1.1, I'm going to read it in the original language. Here's what it says. What John is writing in 
approximately 95 AD, so approximately 500 years after 500 years after uh, Protagoras and Heraclitus. John writes this, in RK in ha lagos, kai ha lagos in pras ton theon, kai theos in ha lagos. What did you hear there? Lagos. So we translate lagos as word. So we could actually read this, in the beginning was the logos, and the logos was with God, and the logos was God. Now, if Heraclitus was reading this, which you've been long dead by this time, Heraclitus would say, in the beginning was logos. Heraclitus would say, yeah, 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 I agree with that. And the logos was with God. Heraclitus would go, yeah, and the logos was God. Heraclitus would say, yeah, I'm with you. Okay, now you turn to John one fourteen, And this is where Heraclitus would have said, what? John 1, 14. Kai ha lagas sarks agenita kai sk no sin in human kai. And we can go on. It says, and the lagas became flesh and dwelt among us. So Heraclitus, if he was reading this, he'd say, yeah, yeah, the lagas is God. And then, what? The lagas put on flesh and dwelt? Dwelt what? And dwelt among the, the central feature of the cosmos, the thing that holds all things together, the thing that created everything. Yes, Heraclitus would say, yes, that's that's God. It's God-ish. But then all of a sudden, you're telling me that that logos put on human flesh and walked among us? And and John would say, Yeah. <laughs> and Heraclitus would go, Where do I meet him? Now, if Jesus was, you know, Heraclitus was walking, you know, Jesus, I can just imagine Heraclitus jumping on a boat, going to Jerusalem, trying to track Jesus down to see the Lagos, right? And listen to the Lagos. Um, now, for us, if we were to talk to Heraclitus, we'd say, yeah, yeah, uh, he was crucified by mankind. Mankind rejected him. And Heraclitus would say, what? They rejected him? Because he might say, oh, those dirty sophists, right? <laughs> uh, they crucified him? Yeah. But this Lagos, guess what? Resurrected. It's the right hand of the Father. Ascending is going to come back in glory. I want to know more about this Logos. Well, we have his word right here before us to listen to. You see, you hear that? So, Colossians 1.15, okay? Uh, we, we hear this about, Paul is talking about this, about Christ, and this is so powerful here. Um, Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for in him... All things in heaven and earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, all things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or heaven, by making peace through the blood of the cross. And what do we hear there? We're hearing what? Jesus is what? The central feature of the cosmos. Everything came into existence. Can you guys imagine? Okay, so when, when, the, when the, the Magi came to see the babe laying in the manger, and they bowed before Jesus, it makes sense. Right there's a central feature of the cosmos, the one that holds all things together, the one through whom everything was created, right there in that manger. Yeah. That's why they bowed. That's why they worshipped. Now, here's a really great quote from this uh, uh, theologian named William Barclay. Greek thought knew all about the Logos, right? We've, we've covered that. It saw in the Logos the creating and guiding and directing power of God, the power which made the universe and kept it going. St. John came to the Greeks and he said, Hey, for centuries you've been thinking and writing and dreaming about the Logos, the power which made the world, the power which kept, keeps the order of the world, the power by which men think and reason and know, the power by which men come into contact with God. Jesus is the Logos that comes down to the earth. Boom, right? Huge. That's a mic drop, right? So, as a result, okay, it must be understood that Western civilization has a local-centric framework, and it's under the attack of the deconstructionists. And with this attack, Christianity's local-centric view is under attack as well. 
even though much of Western civilization will not equate the Logos with Christ, nonetheless, Christianity is in the crosshairs of the deconstructionists as well. Our view of right and wrong, sin and righteousness, objective order through creation, our sexual ethics are all a product of a logocentric worldview, a worldview that the deconstructionists want to destroy. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay? It's really strange they focus on Christianity and not like on Islam. You don't see them deconstructing them, you know, Islam at all. So yeah. They tell you about both of them. <laughs> yep. But we're very weak. Yep. Sorry. We have to keep in mind that the Western civilization as we know it in America, now we can go on this great, great talk, and there's 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 lots of books spilled on whether America was a Christian nation or influenced by Christianity. It's a whole nother conversation. But nonetheless, it still remains is that we had a logo, we have had a logocentric worldview, and what's happening is that's being dislodged. And so it's not like we're exempt from it. Okay? Um, give you an example. When I went to the city council to speak, I went as a proponent of what? A logocentric worldview. And I, I was I was advocating for that amongst and before the council, a logocentric worldview. And I'm surprised I have not got a ton of hate mail and stuff like that. And, you know, so I'm actually considered very fortunate that, you know, we haven't had a bunch of blowback on it. Okay? So, hold on to this. Understanding one's enemy. Perhaps the idea of the Protagoras and the Sophists and the Deconstructionists is best captured by the words of Judges 17.6. In those, day, there, in those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. We could rephrase it loosely to make this application. In those days, there was no logos in America. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Okay. So besides the rejection of truth, culture and society cannot function with the mindset of everyone doing what is right in their own eyes. This would lead to complete chaos and a breakdown of our whole civilization, This mindset brings forth a godless anarchy, hell on earth. Okay. Throwing a lot at you. What can we what can we clarify? Is there anything we can clarify in this? Any anything, any observations as you're pondering this? Um, are you tracking with what I'm saying here? Yes. What I'm saying is that Satan has really done a number on not only say America, but the whole world, and he, of course, is, he wants the power throughout all of it, and he doesn't want anything to do, anything to do. God is not, and God is a God of love and a God of, of um, building. Order. <laughs> you know, yep. that he's, everything that he does is made well, so uh, but Satan wants to destroy the whole thing. Yep. He wants everybody in, in hell with him. Yep. Remember that uh, Donald Barnhouse quote that I've said probably too many times? What would mm-hmm. what would uh, a city look like if Satan overtook the city? Remember that? Yeah. 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 Uh, streets would be pristine, clean, da, 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 and the church would be full where Christ mm-hmm. is not preached. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. And so... You don't have to, you know, you don't have to attack the peripherals if you can what? Dislodge this. Okay? Now, I'm going to say personally, personally, this is why I appreciate the Missouri Synod and why I appreciate St. Paul's. Uh, St. Paul's has a history of being connected to the divine service and our historic hymns. My concern, my, my, my concern is if we are going to be doing a bunch of new liturgy and new songs, we would have to what? Make sure to strain that of what? Of deconstructionist kind of stuff. Whereas we have historical liturgy that dates back hundreds and hundreds of years, and we have hymns that have been time-tested that I, for me as a pastor, I feel very comforted by that. And I think I think you should you too should feel comfortable by that. That is something what that is we can hide in. That's going to be very local centric. Look at our divine service. Who does it fix its eyes upon? Christ and His work. We 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 sing praises to God the Father. We pray the Holy Spirit will create in us a clean heart, and we focus on Christ and His redemption for us. 
It's very logo centric. Our divine services. Yeah. You know, and all this, you know, people say we don't need to come to church. You know, we can commune in our own way with nature and stuff. But with everything that's going on in the world, where do we get strength to withstand everything that's going on out there? This is the only place I can come and feel rejuvenated <clears throat> to be able to withstand another week of. Yeah. 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 Amen. Yeah. No, right on. Absolutely right on. And that's that's the whole of the Christian church, the gifts that were being given. And so we that, that actually segues how are we doing time. That segues into our last paragraph. I'm gonna read that, then we'll we'll leave a little time at the very end. That segues perfectly into this. What is truth? Where is truth? Here's what we have to remember as Christians, okay? Uh, what we have to remember as Christians. If we expect to find truth about our identity, purpose, and life after death from what the majority of people believe and teach, we will be severely mistaken. The reason is truth does not depend on popular polling. Truth is not does not care on the popular crowd thinks. Truth is not a reed blowing in the wind of popular fads. Truth is not like a chameleon that changes colors according to the color of its surroundings. And so we cannot base truth upon what other people have determined and concluded, no matter how many people agree. So we're back again to our question, where do we go to find truth? Yes, where do we go to find the certainty of truth? We must never forget that truth is not some ideology. Truth is not a thing hidden in our hearts or something buried deep in our subconscious minds. Instead, the truth regarding who you are, where you're going after death, and how you will get there is connected to Jesus. Truth is not an idea, but instead truth is a person. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So truth, the word, put on human flesh. So if you want to know what truth is, we listen to Jesus. It's that simple. We listen to his word. And so truth is listening to his truth. Okay? The Logos is Jesus Christ. To deny the Logos is to deny Jesus. And to deny Jesus is to be left with mankind and mankind alone. And if mankind is the sole source of meaning in this world, a depressive, nihilistic spirit will emerge. That was cut off there. So what I mean by nihilism, <clears throat> nihilism is this idea that nothing matters. And nothing matters because there is no God. There's no meaning to life. And if you disconnect yourself from the Logos, then it's up to you as the person to figure out why you're here, where you're going, what is the purpose of life, and all those things in between. I would actually assert that the reason why our younger generation is... Uh, as we would see, and I'm not saying it's disrespectful, but the younger generation is, seems to be so dislodged and panicking trying to figure things out is because they're being brought up in a non-logocentric worldview. They're brought up with the idea that they're the meaning of all things, that everything depends on them, and what? Um, the truth is within them. And that is a horrifying burden to bear. Think of it this way. If you are the only source of meaning in the world and everything depends on you, then you are functioning as if you are what? Having to be the pressure of God. We all want to be God. That's our simple nature. We want to, we want to be God ourselves. We want to be master commanders of our own universe. And if we're given what we want, it's horrifying because then everything depends on you. You have to come up with all your answers. You have to figure everything out. You have to divide, derive meaning for your life purpose for your life, why you're here, where you're going, and all that weight comes down on the person. Which is why <clears throat> you'll break two ways when that happens. You'll go to despair, and you want to what? Just, pardon me, but you, you want to kill yourself, because it's like, that's just too much pressure. Or you say what? Let's eat, drink, and be merry, because tomorrow we die. Okay? And so... What I'm contending for is that the fight that we have before us is to fight for a logocentric worldview, and the fight is what? The deconstructionists coming to tear everything down, and we have to maintain, we have to hold firm. Okay? So we have about four minutes here. Uh, thoughts as we're pondering this? Yes, Josh. 
since deconstructionists reject concreteness and the incarnation of the God, you can't even nail down their position. How do you fight what you can't find or identify? Because I know a guy, and we both do, who loves this stuff. You can't have a rational conversation with this kind of ideology. You just can't find points of yeah, so the deconstructionist is trying to tear down. So let's just use, um, hypothetically, um, you got Johnny and Susie, <clears throat> and Johnny's going to talk to Susie. If you're going to start from the position that, okay, let's say Johnny is a logocentric and Susie's not, okay? If you start from that presupposition that, he, that Susie's uh, is logocentric, you start having that conversation, uh, what's going to happen is you may win that argument, but then next week, what? Susie's going to tear down all the rules and just do whatever she wants. We have to understand that deconstructionists, they will use words not to define reality, but they use words as a simple tool of power to tear things down. And so I can, I can like, let's just say, Josh and I were to have a debate over this. Let's just say we would, we would define our terms, and then we would, we would agree on kind of the rules. Well, think of it this way. Okay, imagine, you, imagine, imagine you're going to a, uh, play a football game. And you show up, and you have your football equipment on, you have your, your football and your helmet, and you walk onto the field, and you look around, and it's a baseball field. You say, what on earth? You're like, oh, no, we're just we're playing baseball. Well, you can't, you can't do that. They said, no, no, we're, we're playing, and we're going to win. And then all of a sudden, you come up to bat, you hit it, and they grab the ball, and they run, and they throw it into a hockey net. I mean, this, is, this is what we're dealing with, because... We function from a logocentric worldview where words have meanings, there's an order to things, and they, what, are tearing this down. So we can actually nail them down, get them all, what, figured out, and then they, what, change the rules. So the only thing that we can do, in my humble opinion, is we catechize and teach who has ears. You who have ears, let them hear. And with those individuals, frankly, I, I, I don't really have time for it. So I'll give you an example. When I went to the city council... I was not there to speak to the deconstructionists on the council. I was there to speak to the people in mind who may what have ears to hear. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. So my goal was not to necessarily convince the council, it was to speak so that other people who are listening might hear. Okay? I was well, just gonna get to that very point. The, in order to get to the position where you're not looking at a logocentric Worldview, you actually have to deny the logocentric worldview. Yep. The default position is to look around you and realize there is a creator. Yep. That all of creation attests that there is a God. So the default position is that it's logocentric, and you have to deny that to yep. get to uh, a sophist worldview. So I was just going to say that someone who is actively denying it, there's no speaking to them. Yep. You can speak truth, and those around hear that and. It is true. So yep. that we have that advantage. Yep. Yep. That makes sense, you guys. And so I, I think, I think, unfortunately, I think we can we can spend a lot of time trying to convince a sophist, and as Bo rightly said, they have spent all their time and energy denying what is plainly set before us that there's a created world by a creator, and so in a lot of ways, you're not going to necessarily win that. So you confess truth. By God's grace, they may hear, and if not, at least those around will hear and be strengthened. Yes? So the beautiful thing about it is that the word of God does what it says. It's, it is a scripture word. So the hope that we have is when we're confessing God's word, his word is doing things. Yep. Where, did, where Satan and the deconstructed forces can only tear down that and destroy the Yep. And so instead of getting... Um, in despair over having to dialogue with someone that would be deconstructionist, we can simply just proclaim the word that is already created. Yep. The other thing to keep in mind, again, I mentioned nihilism, and this this should cause us to weep. The end result of this kind of thinking of a sophist worldview is going to be nihilism. It's it's, it's inevitable. If there's a there's a despair. We are created as created beings. And we're not meant to be the creator. We're not built to bear that weight. And so perhaps when maybe a person's reached the end of their rope, as they say, right, the end of the road, that we may be there compassionately to declare the Logos, Christ, for them and the forgiveness of sins. And if they reject, then guess what? Keep on confessing Christ. 
It, 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 we confess Christ in season and out season. Now, right now, keep in mind, the church is out of season. We have to keep that in mind. We are out of season. Uh, but Paul says what? We preach the word in season and out of season when people listen and when they don't. And so we're out of season right now. We have to embrace that. We're out of season. But nonetheless, our mission stays the same. We confess Christ. Okay. And what's really sad is there was, like, early 2000s Christianity, uh, American evangel- evangelicalism let in, like, a very popular deconstructionist by the name of Rob Bell. Like, yep, yep. And, I mean, his teachings are still yep. out in evangelical churches. Yep. You know, very thankful, you know. <laughs> yep, I used I used to follow Rob Bell for a while, and I was I was caught up in that way way back in the day. And yep, he is absolutely one hundred percent right. He is a deconstructionist, one hundred percent. Well, what says a lot of churches let him in. Yep. So now they don't even stand on truth because even these type of Christians, in quotes, you know, want to deconstruct everything. Yep. yep. You know. Yeah, the little leaven leavens the whole lump. Correct. Yep. Yes, Mike. Yes, you have just explained. Why the world, and especially our young people, have so much anxiety, yep. depression, yep. Uh, suicidal thoughts, actual suicide, PTSD, uh, and why there's so much sadness yep. and hopelessness in our society, especially our young people in this generation. There's a lot of factors contributing to that, but I would I would I would agree. I would say that that I would say that's not talked about is a deconstructionist nihilistic worldview that creates that. Absolutely, I would I would I would stand by that. Yeah, yeah. Fascinating stuff, guys, huh? So, in the future, here as we we continue to go on as a church, this is something I want us to please take this home, think about it, ponder it. This is the fight of this generation, which includes you, okay? This generation right here, all of us. This is our fight to what? Uphold a logocentric worldview here in St. Paul's and as we confess Christ here in Minot. And so this is, again, as the Seminex was the fight of our previous generation, this is the fight of the present day right here and right now. And so may God, what, create in us a clean heart, sustain us, uh, keep us steadfast in the truth, and to what? Confess Christ, logocentric. Okay? All right, let's stand and pray. Move this morning prayer. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. And I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil that all of my doings in life may please you. Bring to your hands, I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Thanks, everyone.